what is Christian nationalism? Today on Life Talks, we'll be d- digging into that question, and I thank you for joining us. My name is Ben. I'm here with Dan. We are two of the teaching pastors at Life Fellowship Church in Cornelius, North Carolina. Dan, how are you doing today? Doing great. Looking forward to this topic. Yes, and this is something we decided to talk about uh, for a number of reasons. Why do you think it's important to talk about this issue today? Well, um, one of the reasons on on this day that we're recording this, um, we have a new administration that has just a few moments ago been uh, sworn into office. Um, But among the turmoil, um, the topics surrounding the turmoil that has um, been a part of this election cycle has been um, the rise of Christian nationalism. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I think it's important that we discuss it and discuss it um, honestly uh, for what it is and what it isn't, mm-hmm. um, I, I think in the hands of the, the media and the left, it is being used to bludgeon evangelicals yeah. at a moment when some evangelicals need bludgeoned, quite frankly. <laughs> but I, I think I think it's being used excessively and incorrectly to yeah. describe some things, mm-hmm. because there's a difference between Christian nationalism and and. Uh, Reconstructionism, which some people want to kind of uh, envelop. But the other thing is, I think some Christians need to be aware of the tendency that we in the United States of America have to wrap our Bibles in the American flag. Mm. And in doing so, we adopt some of the characteristics of Christian nationalism that I believe are patently unbiblical. Yeah. And I also think they show an immaturity of perspective as it relates to the whole of Scripture and what our future looks like in mm-hmm. the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of why I wanted to, to, to talk about this with you today, because I'm hoping Hopefully we'll clear up some misconceptions, but more than that, I hope we'll provoke some thought. Yeah, I think I've seen some articles on this and some of the, the, the new sites I go to. Um, but I think any anyone who saw, you know, we talked, we spent a couple episodes talking about the the January 6th. I don't even know what to call it. Some people are calling it the insurrection the, or the attack on Capitol Hill. Uh, insurrection is a convenient but incorrect term uh, to yes. describe it. It was a mob and it was a riot, yeah, uh, uh, but it was not an insurrection. Okay, if so. it was, the people who designed it are really among the most incompetent <laughs> insurrectionists that have ever existed in the history of insurrection. It was so so the, the the riot on Capitol Hill on January sixth. Right, but I think it shocked some, and and I was one of them. Maybe it was I should shocking. Be shocked. Yeah, it was I mean, shocking, it, yeah. but but to see people with. Jesus 2020, people carrying crosses. It was, there were Christian symbols that were a part of some of the people that were there, yes, right? I'm not yes. saying like, you know, there were, this was a Christian movement, but the the reality is there are people who thought differently about that that moment than you and I did. And we've got to undig this reality that there are people that, like you said, they wrap the Bible you know the, the the Christian or the American flag around the Bible, or they they drape the American flag over the cross, and I've seen paintings like that, oh, sure. right? Yeah. And so it's one of those things that we've got to learn how to uh, separate, divorce the reality of the kingdom of God with the nation of the United States of America, and realize that they are not intertwined, right? Right. It, well, they're not intertwined but yes they are intertwined and that's part part of the dilemma but by the way this isn't new to this country mm-hmm. i mean uh, christian nationalism uh, is what ruled uh, europe for yes, generations you know because they literally had uh, uh state-sponsored churches, and, yeah. and to some extent still do, mm-hmm. even though the churches are largely impotent. But uh, this, is, this is nothing new. Mm. Um, and in fact, God mm. first established the separation of church and state with the nation of Israel when the king came from one tribe and the priests came from a completely different tribe. And you didn't select kings from a diff- from the priestly right, tribe, right. And, you didn't dis- and you didn't draw priests from the king or the, the royal, the, the line of Judah. Uh, so... The, you know, and and we need to pay attention to the model that the Lord set up, that God set up, even in among Israel. And this is where Reconstructionists and and uh, hyper nationalists make a huge mistake in not understanding the theological precedent hmm. that really discourages this kind of intertwining between civil authority and spiritual and yeah. religious authority. Now. You know, you and I come from Baptist backgrounds, and even in the United States of America, Baptists have been big separation of church and state people. And, and I think we have to—that's a great point, because I think so many of us, we think we equate baptism, Baptist or Baptist theology with this idea of um, conservative legalism. You know, right, right. really, the, the, at the root of Baptist theology was this idea that 
church and state were separate. Yeah, it's one of the basic tenets of of the Baptist, and maybe sometime it'd be a fun thing to you know study. I don't know if it's necessarily a, a, a podcast appropriate for the podcast because we're part of a non denominational church. But among the distinctives of a Baptist that separates them from other Protestant and other evangelical denominations is the separation of church and state. But it draws its roots from the fact that the king was not to go into the palace in Israel, and the high priest was not to go. Or, uh, I'm sorry, the king was not to go into the holy uh, holy place. The holy place, yeah. And nor was the uh, nor was the priest to go into the palace. Mm. Uh, they met on neutral grounds, um, and so the, the, you know there there was this distinction uh, that also symbolizes the fact that man has to rule the earthly kingdoms, and he does so under the authority and direction of God. Mm-hmm. But that never supersedes, nor does it even approach the kingdom of God, which is far beyond national yes. borders. Yes, and that's where I get frustrated with American Christian, the brand of American and Western Christianity that seems to have so closely aligned how we do government with how we do the gospel that we have become exporters of that hmm. with an evangelical fervor around the world mm-hmm. that in many cases tries to westernize other cultures and, and also to some extent ostracizes other cultures. So mm-hmm. one of the things you know, for instance, I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in the 70s. In 1976, uh, there was the um, the uh, um, celebration of the National Bicentennial in 1976, 200 years since the founding of That's a nation. That's when I was born, Dan. Oh, my goodness. But that was a big so deal. So you were so celebrating I'm, when I was, I was a right. little, I was little, little peapod. I was 15. <laughs> and let me just tell you, every part of our nation was so thrilled with this. I mean, there were parades. There were fireworks shows. There there were musical cantatas done mm. in churches. I yes. was in one of them yes. where we sang, um, you know, the songs of exaltation of our nation and its Christian heritage. Mm. And you can't deny that our nation did have a Christian underpinnings, a Christian foundation. Our nation was founded uh, largely by Puritans and people that were leaving religious persecution. The very tenets of the, of our Constitution celebrate the fact that we're a nation under God and that, and that we have these values. Uh, uh, but we we integrated it at a level uh, that that was amazing, and by no small coincidence, four years later we elected someone to office, Ronald Reagan, who literally wrapped himself in the flag while holding a Bible, mm. uh, and and brought about the awakening of the religious right. At mm. that time, it was called the Moral Majority, but they catapulted him mm. into office with record uh, uh, um, amounts um, th- through his electoral college winning and and uh, just the percentage of vote he got. So uh, these these were the heydays, the high days of, of religious nationalism. Uh, so when I was growing up, uh, you had to have a Christian flag on one side of your platform yes. and an American yes. flag. Yes, I remember uh, that. Every morning when I went to my Christian school, we pledged allegiance the, to the flag, yes, to yep. the Bible, and to the Christian flag. I, You know what's so funny you mentioned that? I told my kids that we had we were talking about that last week. And uh, I said, oh, yeah, I used to pledge allegiance to the Christian flag in the Bible. Like, do you still? I'm like, oh, yeah, I could totally. I, I, I could. I know. I know. I mean, you and I could could stand up and pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Redeemer for whose kingdom it stands. One, one Savior, Savior crucified, crucified risen, and risen, risen and coming in with life everlasting for all who believe. Like, that's. We that's did that every day. Every single day. I know it just as well <laughs> as I know the, the the Pledge of Allegiance. And and that was a hallmark of Christian education, Christian schools. Uh, uh, Awanas did that, yeah. I believe, in, in the church. We would sometimes do that at church services. We would sing patriotic hymns periodically. July 4th, July yeah. July 4th. We would yep. have God in Country Day. Yep. Um, and I'm not going to say that it is wrong for a church to, for instance, honor its veterans on a certain day or to acknowledge that. However, after I left Missouri and after our, I I left uh, the, a very narrow brand of Christianity, fundamentalist Christianity. You're so nice. So I, <laughs> I moved to South Florida. And in South Florida, I was pastor of a church that transitioned from a con- from a congregation that was white, Amer- uh, you know, born in America, white, uh, conservative, um, patriarchal or whatever. Yeah. And to a, by the time I left that church, 18 years later, it had 57 different nationalities mm. in it. And the majority of the people that went to church there on Sunday were not born in this nation. Mm. Um, and they still had some allegiances to their foreign countries. Right. Not because, I mean, they came to America, they loved America, mm-hmm. but also, you know, they spoke Spanish or they spoke French or they spoke, yeah. you know, uh, uh, you know, an African dialect. And, and we found that it was important to leave that nationalism 
at the door mm. from wherever you came because there were even sub conflicts in the congregation between for instance Haitians and Bahamians <laughs> or Jamaicans <laughs> yeah uh, you know there were, yeah. there were those there were sub conflicts so it was like leave your nationality you leave yeah. your national identity outside when we come in we're kingdom we're, we're, we're citizens of heaven we're, we're brothers in Christ and we serve no king but King Jesus that's good and and, and so it transformed the way I looked hmm. at things within the context of the church. Then I moved back up to the Bible belt and the belt buckle, the Bible belt, and once again played through that again yeah, yeah. Uh, to a point where there were times <clears throat> when I felt like if I came from India and visited the church that I was pastoring, I would have felt unwelcome. Yeah. And in fact, I know that times they were unwelcome. I literally knew people that would say, you need to find a church that where you worship with your own kind. Mm. That kind of unbiblical, horrific, mm. racist type of mentality was ingrained into that. So you, I see all of that. But now all of a sudden we have this different scenario, particularly in the last four or uh, five years. And and there there was a sense that we're, we're losing our American way of mm-hmm. life. And it, intrinsic to the American way of life was freedom of worship and the prayers and a lot of emotional things. And in doing so, we turned to, um, you know, a, kind of a a, a leader and many evangelicals saw that in Donald Trump, mm-hmm. and and so you've seen the schmaltzy uh, pictures of Jesus holding Donald Trump. You've yes. seen, and then you've seen these huge convoluted arguments that that wanted to say, you know, well, Donald Trump's a Christian. Uh, to Corinthians uh, type of Christian, <laughs> but a, you know, uh, um, and, and and would wash whitewash, so to speak, um, some of the egregious behavior and yeah. conduct, both in his past and in his present. Mm-hmm. And and yet they kind of raised him as a messiah. Mm-hmm. Now, when I say that, I know already people are getting, they're firing up their email accounts to send me, you know, how, how wrong I am about this. But, you know, looking at it objectively, it, it occurred. It occurred. Um, they, they, there was a willingness to give a benefit of the doubt for the sake of political identification to someone who was clearly not a a, a practicing Christian. Mm-hmm. Um, and by any definition, a practicing Christian. Yeah. And before you call me judgmental, you know, first of all, don't, don't give me the do not judge, let you be judged because <laughs> then you're showing your, your human, hermeneutical ignorance um, and your theological shallowness to, to use that because that that's not a correct passage to talk about judging. But by anybody who discerns based on the standard of the word of God, this is not a man who had a vibrant walk with God mm-hmm. or much evidence of any walk with God. And yet we wanted to see him to some extent as a savior to the vast values, um, a protector. And to some extent he was. Yeah. But my contention is it wasn't because he believed them. It was because he needed the coalition of believers yes. to be able to support him. Yeah. And and so this became almost rabid. And and then a lot of these people go to the same church together. They, you know, they, they do love the Lord. Mm-hmm. Uh, they identify with the values, you know, the conservative justice, the pro-life, the, mm-hmm. the you know, the, the things that resonate with conservatives. And in doing so, it came to a point for some, not everybody, but for some, it almost became a, a worship. Yeah. And in that, it gave the rise to this nationalism, whereupon on January 6th, you saw people carrying flags and Bibles, wearing ichthmuses and, and uh, Jesus 2020 um, T-shirts mm-hmm. um, and, and, and walking through the steps of the, of the, of the, mm-hmm. up the steps of the Capitol into the building illegally. Mm. And uh, to deny that is to deny the reality of history. Mm. And so we have to ask, is that what God wants for yeah. us? Yeah. So here's a question, and and this has been going through my mind: is what what do you think is the difference between Christian nationalism and patriotism? Because I think we would all say there's patriotism is a good thing, yeah. right? What we're saying is there's the da- there's a danger there's a, there's a possibility of danger or concern at least with Christian nationalism. Yeah. So what's the difference? I think it has to do with priority. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> for instance, you know, I would consider myself to be a patriot. I love our nation. I love our country. Mm-hmm. I love its values. I, I love its opportunity. Um, but I also have Canadian Christian friends who love Canada and, and, and British who love Great Britain uh, and who adore the Queen. And I, yeah. I look at the Queen and I say, "Why? That's a national <laughs> pet. Why do you? Why do you? Why do you want somebody like that?" Um, you know, I have Vietnamese friends who mm-hmm. appreciate their country even when they don't appreciate their government. Mm-hmm. Um, and wherever I go, I, I think patriotism is, is okay. But nationalism is is different 
uh, particularly the American style, that, you know, and there's this religious imagery. You know, Ronald Reagan ca- called America a city set on a hill. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a phrase lifted from Scripture. Yeah. So, so there is this mentality that says America is special because of the way it reveres God. And I do believe there have been blessings that come yes. from that. Mm-hmm. I believe there come some freedoms and some privileges that we've had that come from that. So I'm not in any way denouncing that. But I'm saying you have to prioritize the kingdom. You have to look at things eternally mm-hmm. and not temporarily. Mm-hmm. And so in 100 years, I will not be an American. In 100 years, I will be a member of the kingdom right, of heaven. Right, right. So the priority is an easy one to make. Mm. Do, do I, you know, and and would I fight for my country? I I, I would. Yeah. Um, my son is a Marine. My my great-great-grandfather was a colonel in the Union Army. My great-grandfather was in World War One. My grandfather was in World War Two. My dad was in the Missouri National Guard. I lost a cousin at Vietnam. My family has served for this country mm-hmm. and been part of it. I'm actually the only one who didn't serve in the military for generations. Um, but but uh, patri- patriotism is important. I, I believe in that. However, compared to my allegiance for Christ and the Bible and godliness and the things that matter, it is, it's small. Yeah. It really yeah. is small. And the, and the thing is, I don't have a passion for spreading Americanism. I do have a passion for spreading the gospel. Yes. And I think it's offensive for many American missionaries. The way we have approached missionaries is a kind of a colonial mindset where we move to a foreign country. We set up this little American compound, mm-hmm. for sometimes for our safety, but also for expediency. And we invite everybody. And then we conduct our services like they were, you know, in in in, in Columbia, Missouri or, yeah. or Columbia, South Carolina. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, we, we alter the words of American hymns and force them to be translated and they don't even sound right. We don't write new hymns in other countries, yeah. in other languages, yeah. you know, and, and, and what, what happens is we've exported the gospel, but it's wrapped in an American flavor, American yes. flag, so to yeah. speak. And in doing so, um, we have, and, and, and I have friends in other countries who tell me this, that some of the opposition they face in their governments, particularly atheistic governments, is that they see American evangelicalism not as a religion, but as a political movement. Yes. And in doing so, we damage the gospel. And that's one of the, I was just going to say, one of the dangers of the, the Christian nationalism, no matter what form it takes, and, and really one of the countries that it had its biggest impact on is the country of Germany. There's a great book I read a few uh, a number of years ago by uh, Edwin Lutzer called uh, When a Nation Forgets God. Mm. And he and he goes in there and, and he begins with describing this nation and it sounds a lot like our nation. Mm. Um uh but he says at one point in human history Germany was the most Christian nation on the face of the planet. And yet within a few decades it produced Hitler and the Holocaust. Mm-hmm. And he said how how did this happen, you know? And he he outlines you know some some things that you know some trends that happened in in that country that he saw possibly happening in our country. It, it, w- it was a very fascinating read. But one of the things I thought was interesting was in World War One, because of the marriage of church and state that was all throughout Europe. Many times the 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 call to arms to defend your nation was a, an act of God. It was a, another crusade. Mm-hmm. Um, my brother, who's over in Germany right now, is a church planter, a missionary, uh, tells me that you know if you you can find these belt buckles from that that every soldier in World War One wore for the German army, and, and it on it it says "God with us." Mm-hmm. They were they they believed um, that what they were doing was fighting for the will of God and for the glory of God, mm-hmm. because God was for their nation, mm-hmm. and yet when they did that. The, the repercussions when you do that and you convince an entire, you know, populace that and there's this marriage between church and state and that the, the wars you're fighting are is a, is a holy war and you're fighting for God and God's going to be with you. When you lose that war, what happens to your faith? Yeah. It's yeah. it gets destroyed. Yeah. And that's why even Hitler used the church to say what we're doing here is an act of God. Like he was crazy and and a cultish and all kinds of uh, horrible things. But the reality is nations all kinds of despots and authoritarians love to use the church yeah, for their it's, own personal means. It's totally means. manipulative, and and it's how they convince people to throw their lives in, into this. Yes, because you're not just dying for your country; you're dying for God, not yeah. king, you know, for for the kingdom of God as well. I mean, and it, it's true of every religion, whether it's Muslims or hmm. or the Vikings who you know <laughs> thought they went to Valhalla <laughs> afterwards because they were fighting for Odin. Yeah, um, yeah. you know, w- that has been a way that 
earthly kings have inspired hmm. by wrapping themselves in, and to do that is offensive. Hmm. How dare we be so presumptuous to claim the endorsement of God? Hmm. Um, and, and so th- that would be a caution. And I know we're, we're about out of time, but um, and, and there's no clean way to clean to, you know, to tie this up. But I, I would just simply say to, to all Christians who are listening to this, even to pastors, for instance, you know, if, if I were the pastor of a church and we've never done this at our church, so it's not a point of controversy, I'd really question whether or not it is appropriate to, to have an American flag on the platform uh, right across from a Christian flag. What does that say to, to non-Americans? Mm. And what endorsement does that apply uh, imply? And it's not that I'm embarrassed. Hang the American flag from your home. I don't want to put, put a flagpole up in your yard. I don't have a problem with that at all. But I'm asking, is the church the appropriate place for right, that? Right. Um, and, and you may draw a conclusion. If I go to my home church in Moberly, Missouri, there's an American flag on the platform. You're not going to get up there and tear it yeah, down. Yeah, it doesn't bother me one <laughs> bit. Uh, so don't make it a test of whether or not you go to church. But I would just ask the question, because when you ask questions like that, it forces you to delve into the answers. Mm. And and for all of us, I, I think we need to just be reminded, we have no king but Jesus. Mm-hmm. We have no hope but heaven. Mm-hmm. We have no source of truth but scripture. And the scripture's better than the constitution. Mm. King Jesus is better than any president who's ever mm. sat on a throne. And and be reminded of that. Because the other thing it does, it prevents us from despair when we when we right. lose right. Um, political power. Yes. There's a lot of people right now that I sense are in despair. Yes. Um, and I'm not. I'm not. Right. Um, because I know this. Sometimes God blesses us by judging us, yes. by purging us, by, by chastening us. And I think he's going to do that here in this situation. And hopefully the American church will cling to the word of God. Hmm. They'll go back to scripture. And there's no constitution, there's no authority on the earth that can prevent us from loving God That's first right. and best. That's right. And so let's just recommit ourselves to that. That's good. Well, we are out of time. We could probably talk a little bit more, but we're going to just end this conversation. And and this is, I think, a great reminder for all of us. Uh, Dan, what you just said there at the end, I think what I want to leave us, and, and if you're listening to this podcast, uh, to just think about is this, what is your hope this morning? If your hope is in anything besides the, the, the re- resurrection and the authority of Jesus, then you have misplaced a hope uh, that will ultimately let you down, whether it's a nation or a person. Um, as believers and followers of Jesus, that hope should never wane, whether it's light or whether it's dark. And uh, that that should be our, our constant reminder throughout our days. And so thanks again for joining us on this conversation. We hope you learned something, and we'll talk to you next time.